वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम ज्ञानातिमिरंद ज्ञानांजना शलाकय चक्षुर्मित ये नस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोभीष्ट स्थापित भूतल स्वयं रूप कदाम दधाति स्वापदाक वंदेह श्रीगुरो श्रीयुत पदकमल श्रीगुरोन्वैसवांश श्रीरूप सागजात सगन रघुनाथ मितम तम सजीव साइत सवदूत परगण सहित कृष्ण चैतन्यदेव श्रीराधा कृष्ण पद सगन ललित श्री विशाखाता हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधु दीनबंधो जगतपते गोपेश गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमो सुते तप्त कंचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानु सुते देवी कलूभ्य कृपा सिंधु बीव पतिता पावने वैष्णवेद नमो नम नमो विष्णुपराय कृष्ण पुष्टा भूताय श्रमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नाम नमस्ते सरस्वते देवी गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्य बारी पाश्चात देश तारिणे हरि श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासरी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna everyone. So, welcome to this nectar of devotion study. So, today we're studying uh chapter 13. Uh chapter 13 is a very important chapter in our um journey from sadhana bhakti to prema bhakti. In our journey through this nectar of devotion. So in this chapter the title is five potent forms of devotional service. These are the five most potent angas of vaidhi sadhana bhakti. We should be careful they're not the most important because the most important have already been given previously which is to take shelter of guru, to take diksha, receive instructions and serving the spiritual master. those are the most important because they unlock the rest of the angas of devotional service but these are the most potent and propad writes in the in the beginning that a small attachment for any of these five items um can arouse devotional ecstasy even in a neophyte so interestingly a small attachment for any of these can arouse bhava bhakti that's devotional ecstasy even in a beginner so it's very powerful statement that is being made by rupa goswami and shri prabhu here and the key words being small amount and neophyte so vaidhi sadhana bhakti again is devotional service in practice following the impetus of guru and shastra the internal impetus is not yet there and the goal of vaidhi sadhana bhakti is to evoke bhava bhakti to go from sadhana bhakti to bhava bhakti right these angas these activities they are there to evoke to bring about bhava bhakti in the heart so we must keep this in mind as we perform these angas You know, we, if we don't if we do them without a goal we're just aimless like driving a car if i don't have a destination in mind then my driving becomes aimless so the performance of these angas is to bring about raghunanda sadhana bhakti and ultimately bhava bhakti so this is the importance and these five will accelerate the effect we are trying to bring about which is to evoke bhava bhakti 
So for each of the five, we'll discuss specifically how they awaken bhava bhakti in the heart. Each of the five potent forms, they have a specific thing they do to help us awaken this uh, devotional service and ecstasy. So we'll keep these in mind. And the five potent forms are worshiping the deity, living in Mathura, reading Srimad Bhagavatam in association with devotees, chanting, and serving the devotees. So these are the five most potent forms of bhakti. And so we'll discuss them now one by one. So the first is to worship the deity. And we see that Srila Prabhupada put forth great emphasis in this process. And the reason is being described here, that if we become attached to the deities, then we will forget our material attachments. One must see the form of Govinda if one wants to forego the nonsense of material friendship, love, and society. Rupa Goswami writes this uh, statement in a very poetic way, saying, My dear friend, if you still have any desire to enjoy the company of your friends within this material world, then don't look upon the form of Krishna, who is standing on the banks of Keshi Ghat a bathing place in Rindavan. He is known as Govinda, and his eyes are very enchanting. He is playing upon a flute, and his head there is the peacock feather. And on his head there is a peacock feather. And his whole body is illuminated by the moonlight in the sky. So Srila Rupa Goswami says, Be careful! Don't look at Govinda! Otherwise you'll lose all of your material attachments. So, Prabhupada comments that this is a very you know, poetic way to explain that you condemn what you're actually trying to praise, and you praise what you're actually trying to condemn. It's a very nice way. But it's a important point here. right? And Srila Prabhupada makes the point, comment here, that every householder should have a deity. That is a duty. He calls it a duty, a responsibility to install deities of the Lord into the home. You know, household life has the potential to become distracted with so many material attachments. And so Srila Prabhupada heavily emphasized this installation of Gornitai deities in every home so that the whole family can center on the worship of the deities and thus we can collectively forget all of our material attachments. Srila Prabhupada went as far as to say that a Gornitai should be in every home, even if they sit on a bookshelf and are just looked at as dolls or displays, it is beneficial. So we can see the great importance um, of, of this uh, deity because it allows us to focus on them and away from Maya. So this is the important um, uh, guidance Rupa Goswami Srila Prabhupada gave on the power of the deity. Right? And how does it evoke bhava bhakti? Specifically, one of the nine symptoms of bhava bhakti is one becomes indifferent to the material world. Eh. And this chanting of the, uh, sorry, the worship of the deities, it makes one indifferent to the material world. One becomes indifferent. And this is how the worship of the deities can help evoke bhava bhakti. So very powerful, potent form of, of, of devotional service and we can see the warning from Rupa Goswami don't look at Govinda or you'll lose all your material attachments so this is the first of the potent angles number two is hearing Srimad Bhagavatam so Srimad Bhagavatam is the ripened fruit of all Vedic knowledge we discussed last time it is the um, the the ripened fruit. It has the most nectarian essence of everything that there is in our Vedic literature. When Shiva Vyasadeva was feeling unfulfilled after completing all of the uh, Vedas, the Upanishads, the Puranas, Narada Muni instructed him, now you write exclusively about Krishna and devotional service. So the exclusive topic of Srimad Bhagavatam is bhakti, devotional service. And uh, Rupa Goswami 
uh, gives us an important statement here that we must throw away all the fruitive results of ritualistic activities, this desire for wealth and moksha. We must throw them out like garbage in order to understand Srimad Bhagavatam. So it says right in the beginning that one has the ability to throw out just like garbage the fruitive results of ritualist activities, economic development, and becoming one with the Supreme. This Dharma Artha Kama Moksha. You know? One cannot understand Srimad Bhagavatam with such pursuits. And specifically here, the tenth canto is given special emphasis that this tenth canto can especially evoke this Baba Bhakti. But we have to be careful. You know, trying to go directly to the tenth canto uh, can be dangerous. Right? We must first develop the mood of renunciation. And what is it that we are trying to re renounce? The renouncing of all the material desires. Then we can understand what is contained in the tenth canto. You know, if we read the Rasa Lila while we are attached to sex desire, our mind will go into a very you know, disturbed place. So, by progressively going through Srimad Bhagavatam, one purifies and develops this mood of renunciation from all material hankerings, and then one can actually relish the sweet pastimes of the 10th canto Srimad Bhagavatam. And how to relish Srimad Bhagavatam? One must be situated in pure devotional service. This is very important. That, that to please Krishna this constantly and actively and following these aspects of pure devotional service, this is what allows one to relish the Srimad Bhagavatam. So by, you know, if we're not there yet, by studying Srimad Bhagavatam, we'll come to the platform and the taste, the full taste will emerge as we enter pure devotional service. And hearing, we must hear, not from the professional reciters, so much instruction last week was given on that, but hearing from the professional reciters, who may be speaking very eloquently, may be orating very nicely, but without pure devotion in the heart, this hearing of Srimad Bhagavatam can be very dangerous. So we must hear from the pure devotee, hearing about Krishna, hearing about these pastimes, from the pure devotee, then has potency. And if we are not a pure devotee and we are speaking on Srimad Bhagavatam, it doesn't preclude us from speaking on Srimad Bhagavatam. This question comes up. Well, then how we can have Bhagavatam class? So few pure devotees are there. No. Then the sadhaka trying to be a pure devotee must simply repeat what they have heard from the pure devotee. Then the potency is there. So if we are simply repeating what has been spoken by the previous pure devotees, then you can have a very successful Srimad Bhagavatam class. And so this is very important. We must again follow in the footsteps. So how Srimad Bhagavatam evokes Baba Bhakti? The attraction to the wonderful activities of Krishna, it will create, it will spark this desire to follow in the footsteps of the Vrindavan devotees. We'll see in Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti this following in the Ragatmika. The Ragatmika Bhaktas are the Vrindavan devotees. So, by hearing about the very sweet and wonderful pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham, this will propel us towards Raghunuga Sadhana Bhakti and then very quickly to Baba Bhakti. So, we'll give up these desires for even liberation. Which is again one of the characteristics of Baba Bhakti, right? Moksha, Lagutakrit. One derives this concept by hearing the pastimes of Vrindavan, of Krishna and Vrindavan. One will easily give these up. So, this is how it, uh, it um, helps evoke Baba Bhakti by inspiring us to follow in the footsteps of these Vrindavan devotees specifically. And that will accelerate our process towards Baba Bhakti. Well, living in Rindavan is emphasized in 10th canto, so that is the third anga 
that is so potent. And where is Mathura? Yes, it is in India. But it is also present anywhere Krishna is the complete center of all activities. So the temple is also Vrindavan, non-different. Because there Krishna is the center of all activities. That is the central characteristic of Vrindavan Dham. Nobody cares about anything else but Krishna. That is the sole and exclusive focus of all the residents. And so, wherever a pure devotee goes, they can also manifest Vrindavan. Because Srila Prabhupada had only one idea, Krishna, in his consciousness. And so he brought Vrindavan Dham with him. That is the power of a pure devotee. And what is so important about it? Once we go there and we see and experience the beauty of Krishna's land and relish all the beautiful pastimes, all the desires vanquish in our heart. We'll never want to return to the material world. Simply remembering the beauty of Vrindavan Dham evokes Baba Bhakti. That was the statement by uh, Rupa Goswami. Right? The birds are chirping in the garden, the Kadamba trees, beautiful amid everything. The banks of the river Yamuna, just seeing these things will evoke Baba Bhakti. All ideas of material enjoyment immediately go away. So remembering this, one then realizes their Swarup Siddhi, their eternal serving mood. What is my eternal service in the spiritual world? By going to Rishi Vrindavan Dham, one begins to relish that. So that is one of the symptoms of Baba Bhakti. Is one, one of those nine symptoms again. One is indifference. The other is relishing this specific mood of service. So, just quoting from uh, the, uh, the book. Such transcendental feelings, never wanting to return to this material world, are aroused immediately and without fail after one arrives in Mathura or Vrindavan. So this is the great potency. Who wants to go to Vrindavan now? That is the opportunity we have. Fourth, Anga. Serving the devotees. Right? Now, we see this quote in, um, in the book. It is very astonishing that I see, that, I, that since I have seen the personality of Godhead, who is washed by tears of my eyes, there is shivering in my body, and he has made me a failure in executing my material duties. Since seeing him, I cannot remain silently at home. I wish to go out to him always. This comment, it seems to be speaking about the, the deity, since I've seen the Supreme Personality of God. But Srila Prabhupada is guiding us in his commentary that the purport of this statement is that as soon as one is fortunate enough to contact a pure devotee, one must be anxious immediately to hear about Krishna, to learn about Krishna, or in other words, to become fully Krishna conscious. So, this is speaking about the pure devotee. It inspires. They inspire our Krishna conscious. What does the pure devotee do? Engage 24-7 in devotional service. So specifically, that by um, serving the devotee, it evokes this characteristic of being very eager to commit one's ta time, not wasting a single moment, this intense eagerness. If you you know came into contact with Srila Prabhupada, you would see a sincere eagerness. And you see how that inspired devotees to go out from morning until night, distributing books, to travel to far and distant places, to establish temples, to preach. They were so eager. There was an intense eagerness. Another symptom of Baba Bhakti. Okay. So this serving the devotee brings out this very wonderful symptom. 
And Srila Prabhupada is a perfect example of this. Not wasting a moment and very, very eager to serve. So by serving the devotee, we can become similarly eager and not wasting a moment. And the final and fifth is chanting, hearing the sound vibrations. We become, quote, bereft of all attachment for material enjoyment. This is the symptom of complete detachment. Again, we'll discuss all of these nine symptoms of Baba Bhakti in a few weeks. But this is what specifically, by chanting, we become completely detached. So all of these, many of these are speaking to you know, forgetting the material world, detaching. We spoke so much about chanting, so we'll move on. So, you know, Prabhupada comments at the end of the chapter that, you know, this five Ungas, a little bit, small attachment, even for the neophyte, can bring about bhava bhakti. We wonder, is this, you know, seems exaggeration. Is it really true? But we have proof that these five are so potent that they can quickly evolve, evoke bhava bhakti. For Opa gives an example of the four, the four Kumaras, who are inclined towards impersonalism, but by smelling the incense in the temple, they became inclined towards devotional service. Similarly, Bilba Mangala Thakur had an immediate transformation by hearing about Rindavan and thus went to Rindavan and gave up all of his attention and became, you know, the pastime Acharya, relishing so many of the pastimes of Krishna in Rindavan. So these are the facts. Now well, you may say, wait a minute, I am hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, I am chanting, I have been to Rindavan, I am worshipping you know, Tulsi Maharani as a devotee. Why is it not happening? Well, the success is guaranteed if we follow these five without offenses. Then we'll make rapid advancement. So we're making advancement, and to the extent we avoid offenses, we will accelerate our advancement. So they're very potent, and we have to do them. And we see Srila Prabhupada, his great mercy. What he did... He designed the morning program to include all five of these angas. Everything Srila Prabhupada did was very specific and methodical. Everything was based on what could accelerate our progress. So why he designed this morning program in a way? We have the worship of the deity, Mangalarti. We have worship of serving the devotee by worshiping Tulsi Maharani. We have the japa, chanting of the holy names, right after the Tulsi Puja. We have this in Srimad Bhagavatam class, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. And Srila Prabhupada brought Mathura Dham to all of us, wherever we may be, all six continents, still waiting for Antarctica. Um, but... He brought Rindavan down there. So in the temple, we can be in the Torah, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, chanting, serving the devotee, and worshipping the deity. All five of these angas, one can do every day in an Iskan temple. Anywhere in the world. This is how much compassion Srila Prabhupada had for us. And how intelligent he was. And how he structured it. Nothing is by chance. Every bhajan we sing, everything we do, why are we seeing Gaurvastakam in the morning? Because the benediction is given that if one chants Gaurvastaka prayers during Brahma Murta, one is assured, guaranteed service in Goloka Vrindavan. So what does Srila Prabhupada do? Okay, we'll sing Gaurvastaka in Mangalarti. To give us this. So everything has a very set prescription. You know, if you see <clears throat> Iskan in general, Srila Prabhupada set it up. It propagates all five of these. Srimad Bhagavatam class. Prabhupada translated and established it as a standard. Chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. We have called the Hare Krishna movement. So much emphasis on chanting. You know, rendering service to devotees. Iskan itself, as Prabhupada writes in the Nectar of Instruction, 
is a place to give the opportunity to associate with devotees. In an association, we can render service. You know, he established very opulent and lavish deity worship. Every temple, such a high standard of worship, consistent around the world, a critical part of the, his ISKCON. So you can see how Srila Prabhupada established these five angas very prominently in our practice. So we may be a practicing them for some time, but now we understand its potency. And by understanding its potency and understanding the goal of Bhava Bhakti, we can hope to quickly achieve them. So in the final uh, paragraph of this chapter, Prabhupada talks about, and Rupa Goswami is presenting, this role of Varnashram Dharma in achieving perfection. It has no direct role, meaning Bhakti is transcendental to our Varnashram duties. But if one is not yet ready to fully commit to Krishna consciousness, then by executing some of our Varnashram duties, we can come to the platform of pure bhakti. And the example given in Waves of Devotion is the, you know, the grahasta life, entering marriage ashram. If one is not yet ready to fully renounce all sense desires, one can enter grahasta ashram where there is an opportunity for regulated sense enjoyment and thus collectively with family come to the process of pure devotional service. So like that, that is the purport uh, how or the, how Varnashra Dharma can help facilitate. But pure bhakti, as we know, is transcendental. It is beyond the Varnashra Dharma. Okay. So these are the five potent angas of, of devotional service. Very powerful and, and wonderful. Any uh, discussion today? Any comments, questions? Yes, Prabhupada. Uh, in the five important, uh, in the five important angas, you said uh, the second one was the tenth canto. It, 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 the the anga is hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, and there is special emphasis on the tenth canto. But we should he, re, hear and recite the whole Srimad Bhagavatam. Is the tenth canto about Krishna? Yes, tenth canto speaks yeah. about Krishna's pastimes. from his appearance through his departure. This is the largest of the cantos. Anything else? Okay, so if not, we'll discuss next week, chapter 14 speaks about this uh, jnana and vairagya, the role of jnana and vairagya in a devotional service. And then from there we'll move into raganuga sadhana bhakti, bhava bhakti, and ultimately prema bhakti. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ananta Koti Vaishya Vindha.